Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. I see, see you all didn't warm up. Did he hear all the wonderful things he said about me? And then <laughs> I am uh, really thrilled to be here. But one of the things that Enrique didn't mention was that I'm also a, a father for uh, children. Uh, my oldest daughter just turned 40, and my oldest son is 37, and I have a 32-year-old. Then I have an 11 year old. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Some, some of you are thinking, boy, that guy looked really smart until he said that, right? So, uh, uh, but one of the, uh, one of the uh, things that has become really clear to me uh, is that we have a different set of issues facing poor children and families uh, than we've ever had in this nation. And it is more difficult, more complicated. Uh, there's more of a need for organizations like Solid Ground now than there's ever been before. Uh, and I have been, you know, trying to get the message out, you know, and uh, we've had quite a year. I've been on 60 Minutes twice, and uh, we did Colbert report twice. That <laughs> twice is enough, I must say. Uh, and, you know, I thought if, if, if you're a guy like me and you want have a message you want to get out to America, I, I believe 60 Minutes was it, right? Uh, hard news. 25 million viewers, uh, but here was the deal with 60 Minutes. I grew up watching 60 Minutes. See, when you're my age, uh, growing up in the 70s, uh, there was no one taking on the scoundrels in the world. Uh, and every Sunday, you could turn on your TV at 7 p.m., and it was the same format every Sunday. Some lowlife was dumping sludge into the canal, right? <laughs> And he denied everything, and you'd be yelling at the TV, and, and the guy, and he'd deny it. And sure enough, Mike Wallace would pull out the photo, right? Is that you, <laughs> right? And you'd sit there and say, it's the same format every week. Why would any idiot go on 60 Minutes, right? <laughs> and then they called me. <laughs> I said, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed Bradley, I, I know Ed, and he said, you know, Jeff, uh, we want to do a, a show on the Harlem Children's Zone, and he saw this look, and he said, what's wrong? <laughs> so I had this look of, oh my God, what, what's going on that I don't know about, right? So, uh, it, it was true, but I, but I was wrong. If I thought 60 Minutes was the place to get your message to America, I was wrong. Do you know whose show you have to do if you really want to reach America? Oprah! Oprah! <laughs> Oprah. I was sleeping Oprah. You know, I mean, everybody knows Oprah, but I really didn't know Oprah. Right? So here's the deal. So I'm, I'm doing any show. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I can say to my family, oh, 60 Minutes, you want to come see? Oh, no, this is terrific. Uh, Colbert, are you interested? No, no, it's, it's fine. Go, we'll see you when you get back, right? So I'm sitting around the table one day. I said, oh, uh, I'm going to Chicago uh, next week. I'm doing Oprah. Oprah? <laughs> You're doing Oprah? You got tickets? like, tickets? You need tickets? <laughs> they, and then they look at you like, don't you know anything, right? So I call Marty, my communications guy. I say, Marty, look, uh, can we get some tickets for the Oprah thing I'm doing? So he says, fine, he calls Oprah. Oprah does the worst thing imaginable. She gives me seven tickets. <laughs> See, if Oprah gave me two tickets, everybody understand that's my mother, that's my wife, you can't go. But everybody in your family thinks they're in the top seven, right? <laughs> <laughs> the whole family like, we going to Oprah, right? I'm like, no, you not. Uh, so you say, so, okay, Jeff, so you, you, what, what is it that, what is it that uh, you want to sort of uh, talk to America about? I am convinced that uh, unless we do something radically different in this country, uh, that we're going to lose our standing. Uh, as the leader of the free world. Uh, I think people are worried about that now. Uh, I think when you look all across uh, this country, uh, we find examples of how we have decided as a nation that we're not going to do the best for our most vulnerable families. Uh, that uh, many times there are uh, laws that are passed, there are uh, structures that exist that actually inhibit children and families from making it. 
I mean, you heard one of those stories today. Uh, why should anyone, why should anyone have to face what our speaker faced and then find no help and no support? Suppose there was no solid ground around. Uh, what happened? You know, you know how many times those kinds of things are repeated all over this country? Uh, and there is no one, there is no one. I tell everybody, you know, they, they ask, you know, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, what was one of the most disappointing things in, in, that happened to you? And I said, growing up, one of the most disappointing things that happened to me being a poor child in a violent neighborhood. Uh, where we were growing up with roaches and mice and vermin and filth. Uh, was that I found out uh, when I was about uh, eight that there was no Superman. And my mother came, you know, I was reading the Superman. My mother came in and I was like, oh boy, when's, when's he coming? My mother said, there's no Superman. And I started crying and she said, oh, I didn't know you loved Superman that much. I didn't love Superman that much. I just thought he was coming to save us. And one day I realized no one's coming. There's no one coming to save you are on your own. It was one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had. Uh, and so part of uh, what I want to make sure happens in this country is that we really leave a legacy. Those of us who are grown, we leave a legacy so our children will be able to continue to lead the world uh, in the best that we have to give. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to know what am I talking about, I, I used to carry around a, a clip from the New York Times, uh, and uh, on it, it said, you know, uh, the budget crisis causes a Rhode Island furor, right? It was on the front page of the A section of the Times. And here was the problem in the great state of Rhode Island. Uh, they had a budget deficit, and uh, they were trying to figure out how to solve it, like most states. Uh, and some wonderful bureaucrat noticed that if you were an adult in the Rhode Island prison system, uh, it cost the state $39,000 per adult. But if you were a child, it cost them $95,000 per year per child to keep you locked up. So the bureaucrat did what they thought was smart. They said, well, if we can lock up adults so much more cheaply than children, why don't we change the age for when we can lock up children and then we'll save the money if we lock the children up at an earlier age as adults. And the state did that. They actually did it. I mean, they intend this wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that happened behind it. This was a debate that people said, okay, oh yeah, let's, that's a good cost saving. Uh, nowhere did anyone say Maybe if it's costing us $95,000 a year to lock up children, we ought to figure out a way to not have to lock up children, right? It didn't even enter into the conversation for anybody. So, so just to compound, you know, and, and look, there are lots of places that you might think if I said a state, you say, oh, yeah, they're really backwards there. Oh, of course, oh, what would you expect? I'm talking Rhode Island. Uh, well, they ended up changing the law and put it back. You know why? Because if you lock up a child in an adult prison, they end up having to go into protective custody, which costs $110,000 a year, right? And so they said, well, it's not saving us any money. And so they changed it back. Uh, I can tell you stories like that from one end of America to the other. What nation thinks so little of its children that this might be a solution we would come up with? Uh, we have situations in this country uh, that, you know, in this, in this 2009, it just baffles me. It just baffles me. I, there was, and, and I actually, someone from the Gates Foundation actually did the research because I was having a, a visit and I mentioned that just in the Daily News in New York, it mentioned that the black male unemployment rate from 2007 to 2008 went from 9.3% uh, to 18.7% in that one year. 